Kelly Dirksen is the Fish and Wildlife Program Manager for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and he is going to tell us about the tribe's work with the lamprey, and we're very excited to have him here today. Thanks so much for coming, Kelly, and let's give him a hand, and I'll turn the microphone over. <laughs> let's temper our enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm not a polished public speaker, but I, um, I'm hoping you're patient with me um, because I really feel passionate about what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I feel like I should get a take from the beer because I think I might drive some of you to, to, to drink by the end of this. But yeah, so um, I, I do work for the tribes of Grand Ronde. I'm part of the Fish and Wildlife uh, Program, so I have four other biologists actually. Uh, three now we have a vacancy so if I don't scare someone off and you're a biologist we have a position open later so that's my plug. Let me tell you a little bit about the tribes of Grand Ron. So the Grand Ron tribes is not a single tribe it's a confederation of tribes um, around 30 uh, different bands and uh, tribes that make up the tribes of Grand Ron. They all came from uh, an area generally from the crest of the Cascades west to roughly the crest of the coast range. Um, in the early 1850s, the tribes were moved from their ancestral lands to this uh, reservation about 1854. In the intervening years, uh, a lot of the tribal lands were lost. This is about 69,000 acres. And by 1954, the federal government with, wanted the tribe to be assimilated with the population, and so federal recognition was lost in uh, 1954. Um, the tribal holdings at that point uh, came down to about a, a, a two-acre cemetery. Um, but tribal elders pushed from the early 70s, and in 1983, regained federal recognition. Ronald Reagan signed the reservation uh, act and restored the tribe, and three years after that, a portion of the historic reservation was restored. So this little teal dot, that's, that's the Grand Ronde's current reservation, that's about 10,000 acres. After restoration, the tribe did a lot of work to um, restore basic functions and, and, uh, and services to the membership. So it was a few years before we started looking outside of the area. So while the tribe ceded these lands to the federal government. They never ceded their interest or their passion for the resources of that area. So starting um, in the late 90s, we started working off the reservation to protect some of those resources. And the one I'm talking about today is Pacific lamprey. So that is a Pacific lamprey. You, it's, a, it's a fish that um, predates dinosaurs in the, in the uh, fossil record. It's incredibly important to the tribe because uh, there, are, there are cultural folks that can tell you some really amazing myths and stories about the origin of this fish. I'm not that guy. You're stuck with a biologist. <laughs> so what I can tell you is as a biologist, you would recognize right away that at a time when you can't buy protein from a store, this was something you can peel off of a rock. Protein would have been something that was dangerous and difficult to get. And this was a fish that literally uses its mouth to climb a dead vertical wall. And so it, it can be just peeled right off of the rock. That gives it some opportunities other fish don't have. It can reach some areas that other fish are gonna have a hard time reaching. And so, I hate to do this, we're gonna do some basic um, uh, biology uh, lamprey 101, but I got props. So, so you hang with me. That is a silicone. I'm going to hand that out. I got another one. <laughs> this is a, this is a cast. These are casts from. Um, I hope so. There now now no no bad jokes here. So these are casts from. Um, adult lamprey that we actually harvested at the falls. And they are, uh, obviously they're the same size because they're an exact cast, but they're roughly the same weight and, and have the same feel of a, a Pacific, adult Pacific lamprey. 
Um, before I go too much further, I want to cover a, a question that I know I will get, and that is, what do they taste like? And they, the, these probably taste better than the real ones. Um, <laughs> I'm not a good proponent for uh, uh, selling lamprey as a food source, um, but, but I don't want to sell them short because uh, if you talk to tribal elders, what you will hear is that uh, some will say that they, they, were, they had to eat them because that was their only choice. Their family made them eat them. That was the only option to eat. But there's a large segment of the tribal membership that still loves lamprey. And when we harvest for ceremonial purposes and do distributions, they all go out. So while I'm going to say some negative things about how they taste, um, they are still really important to a lot of the membership. So we were back. We were going to talk about the life history of this fish. So the, what I'm handing out is, is an adult lamprey. So they spend about one to three years in the ocean where they're parasitic. About this time of the year, they will enter fresh water and they will not eat. So they're like salmon in that way. Um, but unlike salmon, they will spend a whole year overwintering before they go to their stream to spawn. Um, so, that's, uh, so they have to go hang out a long time without eating. And so then they'll return to, their, uh, to a stream to spawn. Uh, a female will, uh, can roughly uh, deposit about 100,000 eggs. Some research shows 200,000 eggs per female. And then what they'll get is these, what will hatch will be these amicetes. And they, for all the world, look like a leech. They don't have an eye. They are a filter feeder and they hang out in sediments for three to seven years where they filter feed. And then they go through this very, they, they develop this rudimentary eye in that time. But then they go through this very dramatic um, transformation where they become a macrothalmia. And that's roughly, if you know salmonids, that's roughly like turning into a smold. At this point, they've gone through physiological changes to adapt to salt water. And they will sometimes hitch a ride with out-migrating salmonids to get out to the ocean where they're parasitic um, for one to three years out in the ocean. So uh, they're, they're not... Um, they need a better PR department <laughs> because they're, they're parasitic. Um, they don't taste very good, at least to me. Um, but they're, they're really critical to the ecology of the area because there are thousands and thousands of amicetes in the sediments that are feeding developing fish. These fish that come back and spawn and die just like salmon are providing nutrients in the stream that are critical to the, to the development and rearing of salmonids. And they also fill the belly of sea lions and other predators that uh, would normally eat salmonids that sometimes eat these guys. So this is uh, the photo on the top left is a photo from uh, 1913. This seems to be fairly indicative of what Willamette Falls was like. So every fish that we get has to cross through Willamette Falls, which is a bottleneck for the fish. And this was not uncommon, just thousands and thousands of lamprey. This, I took this picture uh, probably two years ago. I would consider, also at Willamette Falls, and I would consider that a pretty decent congregation of fish now. So obviously the fish has been in decline for quite a while. Um, most of the, what was known about lamprey just even 10 years ago came from the sea lamprey, which was an invasive species in the Great Lakes. Um, that caused great economic damage to that area because it wasn't native and had a, a significant impact. So for years, what we would read is, well, if Pacific lamprey act like sea lamprey, they probably do this or they probably do that. So a lot wasn't known. And so the tribe knew that to get a handle on this fish, we had to do our own homework. And if we were going to manage properly for this fish, we'd have to answer some of those questions ourselves for this species. And so... Those pictures were from the falls, and so I want to talk a little bit about the falls because that's the origin of both studies I will talk about tonight, and it's another area that's equally important to the tribe. Um, I mentioned that that rock, you can peel these fish right off of a rock. This is where you went to do that. Thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of lamprey would congregate at the falls and bottleneck up, and, and troubles, tribes would come in and harvest them. And we have records of uh, 
numerous records of tribal members asking for permission to leave the reservation to go to the falls to harvest lamprey. So that's, this is a drawing from 1841. This is a shameless plug. This is uh, 2018. Um, so this is a stone's throw from that drawing from 1841. And um, this is just to demonstrate that the falls are still very important to the tribe. And this is the first platform fishing the tribe's done in over 100 years. Worked really hard to get the opportunity to be back out there. But this is where the lamprey, where, this is where our studies start. So we took lamprey and um, each year we tagged about 250 lamprey with telemetry tags. We did surgeries to implant tags in the fish. And then we released them above the falls. And uh, there were 22 of these uh, receiver sites all up and down the Willamette to check out where they went and to get an idea of the timing of their migration and their number. It was originally 11, it bloomed out to 22 as we partnered with OSU and the Army Corps of Engineers and Kramer Fisheries. That looks something like that. So there were, um, you guys were included, notice, like a muse there. Um, but we had those all up and down the Willamette. And this was a huge undertaking because the receivers are expensive, they're hard to maintain, they're really hard to load. So someone was working tirelessly to gather this information. And here's a little of what we found. I only have three years on here, but, but one of the main things we found is that lamprey are not sedentary. You would think if you're not gonna eat for a year, that you might just hunker down and not move at all. But we had, but no one, none of them did that. All of them were moving miles and miles. Some moved 20 miles and then stayed within a two or three mile radius. But there were some that went 60 miles. I think our record was a, a fish that moved 60 miles in three days. So they are very active, even though they're not, uh, they're not eating. And then the other thing you can see from the graph is that we thought they might migrate into the tributaries. That doesn't seem to be the case. They kind of hang out in the main stem until the following spring, and then they move in. And then we'll go to what we're, where we found that they moved. So I actually gave this talk to the um, middle fork of the Willamette folks like a year ago and told them they needed to up their game. <laughs> and that did not go over very well. That joke did not sail. So you will not hear from me anything about Lucky Mute wallowing around in single digits. I've learned my lesson. Uh, no, actually, I, wouldn't, I, I don't see anything bad with the numbers for the Lucky Mute. I think it's fairly representative of the other tributaries. I think the main things we learned from this is that the San Am is obviously the hotbed for lamprey. Um, the water is typically cooler. It has much better spawning gravels typically. I really don't know much about the Lucky Mute past a mile or so upstream. We did do mobile tracking. And at the lower reaches, I notice it's like great for juveniles, but I don't know what it looks like upstream if there's gravels and uh, spawning gravels for the fish or not. Um, the other one I notice is that the Tualatin's the first uh, turnoff spot after you get over the falls, and it's doing really terrible. So if you don't like my joke, you can make fun of the Tualatin people. Okay, so that's basically the migration study. But one thing that sticks out after you do all that work is this. There are 13 dams in the Willamette Basin that block over 400 miles of stream. And if this species is to recover and rebound to the numbers we would like to see, it's hard to write off 400 miles of viable habitat. So we were looking for a way to get past some of the arguments we've heard about why lamprey can't be there. And some of that was that, well, the fish isn't listed, so there's not funding to do to address fish passage issues. And the other argument we've heard is that, well, they probably aren't there for a reason. Um, that one was harder to take. So what we did was uh, set up a study where we could test some of those assumptions which, and we found like a, a, what I think is a perfect or an ideal place to test whether lamprey can survive above one of these dams. To do the test, we wanted to see can we move lamprey above a reservoir and can they overwinter? Because remember, they have to go from in fresh water, they've got to make it through to the next year to spawn it. In that time, they don't eat, they have to develop their eggs or sperm, and they have to avoid predators. 
Um, and we weren't sure if you moved them uh, any great distance whether they would be able to adapt to those conditions. So that was test number one. The other was to determine if they can spawn. If they, if they, have to, if they live, that's great, but they still have to successfully spawn. And then three was to see if uh, the spawn from that year, if they could rear and develop in those streams. Third was to um, see if lamprey in, above the dam can draw other lamprey in. So uh, where salmon have a complex way of finding their natal stream, lamprey are, on, on, are probably on a different track. And so the theory is that um, lamprey go where lamprey are. They follow pheromones. So if you have lamprey in the sediments, that will draw other lamprey. So our idea was if you could get lamprey above the dam, those juveniles are releasing pheromones, that may attract adults back into the catch facility. And then the fifth is how do you get them back out? Because if they're above the dam, it's hard to get smolts out of a, out of a reservoir. And lamprey are even more difficult. They're not uh, as effective swimmers, and some of the same things that work for smolts might not be as effective for uh, lamprey. So we set up a translocation study. So what we did was gather uh, lamprey from Willamette Falls. Um, we got them in a boat, transported them by truck, and then released them at Fall Creek. And uh, the reason Fall Creek is important, hopefully it shows up, it's ideally suited for our study, and I'll explain in a second what, why, why that's true. But at first, I want to cover just exactly what we did. We, each year, annually, we moved 240 adults. We did that between May and September. 40 of those fish typically got surgery and got a telemetry receiver or a transmitter to show off to their buddies. And then we did the same thing we did with the other lamprey, and we did mobile tracking to see where they went. So back to Fall Creek, why does Fall Creek work? Well, it has a catch facility. So this dam was built in 1967. Um, and so it has a means for fish to move up to the base of the dam and then they're caught in this catch facility and then they're transported by truck above the dam. Um, another thing they have, um, I never know if there's core people here, so I wanna be careful. And if you did a, uh, uh, a highlights reel of all the stupid things I've done, uh, it would be a hit. You'd ask me back all the time. So that I do that to, to humble myself to say I, I never understood how this would work. So these are trumpets. The fish were supposed to move, uh, salmonids were supposed to move into these trumpets when the water was high enough. And then they would travel through a pipe that went through the middle of the dam. And then that pipe, uh, shot out directly into a concrete wall. Um, so I think that they, they were looking for a way to say, ah, we gave fish passage, but it, it didn't really work. Um, and, and while I, I'm, I'm teasing the core now, I, I want to really stress as I go further that um, while it was discouraging to, at the higher level with core folks about trying to make the case that lamprey passage has to be considered even if it isn't listed and that going nowhere. Folks at my level did outrageous things. I'm super encouraged uh, by folks that saw the value of lamprey and through their own efforts found ways to help us get where we wanted to go. And I will talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. This is what it looks like now. Those core uh, engineers that run this dam knew that did not work. The way they were running it was not passing fish out. So what they do for uh, typically in November is lower it to the bottom of the pool. It's nearly run of the river. Um, and this worked really effectively for Chinook. They passed, uh, the first year they passed 13,000 Chinook through this system where they were typically getting 30 or 40 through those horns. Um, the following year, they got 23,000 Chinook through that system. So uh, it's brave to do it because it's kind of outside of the norm of core operations. Um, but what, what, when we saw this, we thought, well, there's a way for Lamprey to get back out potentially too. And so that's what we, that's what we tried to do. This is Willamette Falls. This is the area that we go to to gather them. This is in April. But I just wanted to give you a panorama. You get an idea, basically, of what we're looking at. So 
lamprey are looking for very specific spots that are free of debris. They can't be mossy, they can't be too covered with algae. They have to, the rock has to be fairly clean and fairly smooth. Um, and while it looks like a lot of that might be that way, it's really specific shoots. And so you get into these very specific areas to gather them um, to get transmitters in the fish. I am not vain, someone else did these slides. I show up a bunch in these. And uh, I'm not the only one that does work. But it's humiliating to me. That I, it looks like I made a slide of myself doing all the work. <laughs> it's not true. They just didn't want to be on the screen. Um, so that's what we do. We motor into the areas that the fish are at. Got to hike over the rocks. That's me again, leading, doing all the work. <laughs> um, you'll gather uh, lamprey in a bucket. Uh, no more than 10 at a time to get them back in time before the oxygen depletes in that bucket to get them back in a live well in the boat. What you would see is that they're kind of congregated on the edges and then they're down in these pools. So if you reach in with cloth gloves, because they're, they're slick, um, you'll be able to grab the fish and get them into the, um, into the bucket. You need a fish that's at least 10 uh, centimeters in circumference. If, to make it big enough to get a transmitter in. And on other fish, we just gathered healthy looking fish. Cool. The way the falls are set up now, um, PGE puts flashboards in annually when the water starts to drop. And they're trying to shunt more water to the power plant. But what that means is that you're getting the top one to three inches of water from the Willamette River. So it's bath water out there. It's <laughs> Uh, we have a shutoff. We can't do surgeries when it goes over 70 degrees. And so that's our, one of our biggest limiting factors. We have to get in early because um, very often, early part of June, it's already 70 degrees out there. It's not, uh, I gotta be careful now, it's not particularly healthy environment for people to be in. Uh, it can cause all sorts of gastrointestinal challenges. Um, and. Uh, you, it's very often that you work out there and you're going to call in sick. But when we get them back to the boat, that's not just a straight cooler. There's actually a live, uh, an aerator built into it. And then they're transported in these large insulated totes with an agitator to keep it oxygenated. And we keep track of that as we do it. So this is, I think, the first run. So this is dissolved oxygen here. You can see that we were able to maintain that for the uh, 90 mile drive from, from the falls to Fall Creek. Um, and then you can see a big drop in the temperature. We actually put the probe in Fall Creek and there was a 10 degree drop. And so we thought that was just too much of a shock for the fish. So we looked for ways, found other drop sites further down the system so we could reduce that, uh, that drop in temperature. But what we do see is that we are able to maintain the DO uh, in transport. These dips are when you're moving the fish from buckets to, to live boxes and things. So we get them to Fall Creek. Fall Creek is an interesting area if you've ever been there. Uh, we call the people there Fall Cretians because there is a really an unusual community there. Um, we've been stopped. We had all sorts of people argue, but almost without exception, if we could explain what we were doing and why it was of value, we had people actually wanting to help. So I think the general uh, impression I have is that the public was well in support of, of what we were doing. At the dock, that's not always true. When you, when you transport fish from the dock, we're, we're seeing a lot more of, uh, of diehard fishers, and they see these fish as competition or a predator um, against salmonids. And I am sure that, that lamprey uh, do cause fatalities of salmonids, but it's real common for us to find uh, salmon in our, uh, we do uh, uh, trapping on, the, on agency to get population numbers. And we see adults all the time with lamprey scars. So we know that there's a lot that survive. I think there's a lot that don't uh, feed on the, on the salmonids for any great length of time. But we, do, we did get, we, there are some fishers that get pretty frustrated, but I, I always say the same thing, that uh, if you like steelhead or salmon, uh, these fill the belly of those just as well as, as salmon or steelhead. So they have an important role. There's me again, doing all the work. 
So they just get released into Fall Creek, and then shortly after that we do telemetry on the ones that are tagged to figure out where they're going. And we found the same sort of thing that we found in the main stem of the Willamette. They, they will move 15, 20 miles uh, up and down Fall Creek, so they're not at all sedentary here. There's a couple that made uh, the transmitters ended up uh, 40, 50 feet up the bank. So I think some predator decided they were delicious too. And, um, yeah, bears, raccoons. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's certainly birds of prey that will get them. And then um, what's odd to me, or a little odd to me, is the smaller fish on the smaller end of the scale do better after the surgeries than the really large ones. So we've put some large ones out that uh, they survived, but they were, uh, they were looking a little rougher. Uh, subsequent telemetry said they recovered, um, but, it, but it, it really left me a, with a worry because it, it, for at least a day or two, they were really prone to predation because they were, they were looking a little rough. So what did we find? The first year of this was 2013. So remember, we're trying to see if they can live over the winter. And the first thing we found was reds. And uh, if this doesn't look like a red, it doesn't always to me either. But there are folks that are great at ch uh, reading reds from uh, lamprey versus salmonids. And the key thing is typically that lamprey can grab a rock and move it. And so these reds, these nests, are typically a circle where salmonids have to use their tail and they'll uh, they'll beat the rocks to try to free up all the loose material, and so you get kind of a comet shape. The folks that are good at it, they can um, cite it right away. I don't do it enough, and so to me, uh, I feel like I'm making it up half the time if I claim that to be a, a red. <laughs> but I made a career of that, so... <laughs> Uh, oh, and di okay, did they live? So that was the next thing. We did, in addition to the red surveys, we were looking for them, and we found uh, spawned out lamprey. This, incidentally, uh, doesn't taste a lot different than a, a live one. <laughs> it's my bad chip. Um, so the first year we had great success. We saw that they had made it through the uh, they can survive over the winter. They, they adapted to that temperature change, and they uh, obviously succeeded and spawned. Uh, okay, talk about um, make-believe and uh, making stuff up. We had to check whether the eggs developed into lamprey young and if they could successfully rear in Fall Creek. And we, uh, by 2016, we found that they could. Um, they have to get big enough to tell the difference between a Pacific lamprey and a brook lamprey that looks real similar, especially in the juvenile stage. And if you believe me, the brook lamprey will have very often these longer fins, clear fins to the edge, and then this pigmentation. And on this, it looks fairly clear, but as, the, um, but as you move down in size, it's not, it's not quite as distinct. And folks that uh, do this all the time, do a really good job uh, IDing them. But for me, I typically need a 60 millimeter fish or three or four year old fish before I can tell the difference. But this was a great sign for us that all that work of getting fish um, up to the falls uh, showed that, yeah, they can do it. They can actually live there and they can successfully rear and avoid predators. I told you, that the goal was to get lamprey, or the test was to get lamprey above the reservoir and see if they release pheromones that would draw adults into the trap. In 50 years, no lamprey had ever gone into any fish trap at Fall Creek. And then two years after we uh, got lamprey established, adults showed up at the catch facility. And this, uh, to me, this was a, another thing I just I can't say enough about folks at, at our level that want to see something happen. I, when we talk to the Corps about doing this, this is more work. These guys, when they, if they have to transport them, they're going to be in a tank and they're going to hang on to it. They're not going to be poured out. They're not going to be netted out. So we were asking technicians to do work to get them out of the, uh, out of the tank, to get them up on the stream. Uh, when uh, Chad called me about this fish, he was so excited he couldn't talk. 
It was such an exciting day. They had worked hard. They had created, at first, their own lamprey catch ladder because they, they thought, well, our ladders have sharp angles, and this is one of the things lamprey need is they need rounded corners. They have a hard time getting over. They can climb a dead vertical wall, but they have a really hard time climbing around 90-degree turns. And a lot of these ladders don't have that. Even the ones that are being modified under the, the Willamette Biop um, have not invested in these turned corners. And these guys scrounged up money to build their own fish trap to see if we could get fish. Um, this is 15 and 16 they had issues with their entire catch facility. After that, 17 and 18, they are returning without the special catch facility. They're using the same fish ladder that Salmonids use. And I think it is this, uh, this coming summer, this entire Fall Creek's catch facility will be completely modified and it will have rounded corners. It will all have what we need to get Lamprey moving up. So the, the one that I never thought would happen, I thought we, could, we might, if we were really lucky, go four for five. Um, but five out of five to get lamprey back out, you saw the, the image. As you draw down, those lamprey, a lot of those lamprey are in the sediments and you have potential stranding issues. Um, you have challenges for these guys if they make it to this size to get back out. And so it was really sketchy whether these guys could make it back out into the, use the run of the river like they do in November and make it back out. And uh, that was another great call from Chad. As he said, we, we have the weirdest fish in the smolt trap. And he sent these pictures and we started to get macrothalmia moving out. And subsequently, they're actually even using those trumpets um, so I've talked to Greg Taylor, who heads the, this program at Fall Creek. He said, you know, if we're getting them in the trumpets, um, we can count on 10 to 20 times that that is moving through the main channel. And they are seeing them in the, in, uh, the smolt trap. So to me, it gave our folks ammunition, the folks that are uh, speaking for the tribe about these issues in the Willamette and about fish passage for lamprey. It was a way of saying it can work. Not every dam would work the same way. There's some high head dams that this isn't really applicable, but there's plenty of dams that this can work. And, usually, and if with minor modifications, the things that are working for uh, salmonid smolts will also work for lamprey. And so we feel like the study gave us some leverage to start making the case with the core that it, uh, if you're modifying these catch facilities to meet the biop for listed fish in the Willamette, Lamprey aren't listed, but they're heading that direction. And the cost to modify things now will be a lot less than if we wait till they're listed. Um, lamprey were uh, proposed for listing in 2004, but they were listed, pr that proposal included four or five other lamprey species. And so the service had a hard time distinguishing, they can't, couldn't list all of the species on that list and didn't find enough evidence to list lamprey. So I don't, I don't think it meant that Pacific lamprey didn't merit listing, it just meant that they didn't have the information. Folks are working really hard to avoid that listing. I would be happy if we could avoid it, but it's gonna take efforts like we saw at, the, at, at my level with folks at the core making those efforts to find ways to get fish through the system. The first modified trap was separate. So there is a main entrance, a concrete ladder entrance that the Salmonids can go in. That had all the tough angles. These guys uh, built out of sheet metal this interesting um, and smooth uh, ladder systems that was separate. So it wouldn't be real tempting for Salmonids to use it. Um, Lamprey could still use the main system, but, um, but yeah, it was designed specifically, specifically for Lamprey. Just have one. I think you could. I think um, if you if you do the if you think about what lamprey need to get through the system, it, it's relatively simple. It's rounded corners. It's well, salmon could get up there, yeah, so. and it those modifications don't impede salmon at all. At all. Uh, so the question is, if I get this right, do I do I believe they're kind of acting like salmon? Are they going to their natal streams? 
we think it's it's uh, that lamprey go where lamprey, other lamprey are, and they're just uh, that once you've got pheromones releasing ab in, above that system, it attract the fish in. This was kind of a controversy in a in a way because uh, there were researchers that want to just release pheromones into the system, but no one really knows what that concentration is, and you could get disproportionate return to an area, but. Of all the research I know, know of, there's, there's not natal uh, uh, stream affinity, that they're really kind of looking where other lamprey have been. My feeling is that if you're going up the Willamette and you're hunkering down at the base of these falls, you're, you're determined to get there. Whether or not what drew them into the Willamette versus the Columbia, I, would, I don't know of the case there, but I do, uh, I don't think we know enough about the number of uh, lamprey in the Columbia to draw a lot of comparisons, but I do feel like there's evidence that the Willamette is the last major stronghold and that that might draw a disproportionate number of adults. Yeah, so the question was uh, what, what's going on with the fish on the coast? So there's fish that obviously don't go up the Willamette, they go up the coastal streams. Um, there's so little known about the number in the Willamette I think there's even less known about the coastal populations. Um, the, about the only one I can think of is that uh, Winchester Dam did actually count uh, salmonids for a while. Um, they went from, I, I want to say 13,000 to 50 by the late 80s. Um, but, you know, the the interest usually goes with the revenue. So salmonids, you can sell fishing licenses for. Um, there's commercial value. There hasn't been commercial value for lamprey, so there's never been the research. So folks at the counting windows of these dams count salmonids. It's really hard to get them to count lamprey. And so they have on occasion, but they, they skip. So even on um, even in the Willamette where we should have better numbers, we don't. And on the, the coastal streams, I think it's even, I think we know even less. So I think the question is, um, they come into fresh water, they're not eating, they're hanging out for a year, what are they doing? What value do they have and what impact do they have? Um, in the time that they're alive, uh, I spend a lot of time at Willamette Falls and I see a lot of sea lions out there and I see them eating both steelhead and lamprey. Um, I don't know if you're keeping track, but uh, steelhead uh, just two years ago was 14% of the 10-year average, um, and that 10-year average was in the toilet. So 14% of a 10-year average was terrible, and uh, sea lions were eating 25% of those. So when I'm out at the falls, I see a uh, lamprey that's doing a little bit better than the steelhead. Um, I think that's a positive impact. Uh, but the other big one is is after they after they spawn and they die because at that point um, they're returning nutrients to the stream that are that you can only acquire through life out in the ocean, um, and so they're providing nutrients for rearing salmonids and probably for other juvenile lamprey. Yeah, and salmon. So the question is uh, for the on the question of whether they return to their natal stream. There's not enough evidence to know if. Uh, the study is not long enough to know. What we did before, the, before we released fish in Fall Creek is we did uh, electrofishing all through the system, make sure there's no Pacific lamprey. Typical life for a lamprey is seven to 10 years. Um, we know there was no one in there above the, uh, the dam before we planted fish. We planted fish, um, they successfully spawn, they're releasing pheromones and fish come back. So these aren't necessarily uh, the ones that would uh, return to their natal stream, but it's, it seemed clear to me that we were getting um, attraction from the pheromones from released fish. We, uh, the tribe, we have developed a genetics lab and we would love to have that uh, capacity. We're doing PCR for population estimates for deer, so we're sort of familiar with what it takes to do that. Um, but those are three to four hundred samples a year, and this uh, we're talking about, you know, potentially thousands of amaseeds or thousands upon thousands of amaseeds in the system. And I, I, I love that the tribe. Uh, the great thing about the tribe is uh, they remove all excuses. 
you know, they'll fund projects like this if they believe in it and they take any excuse I might come up with away from me. You just have to do it. Um, but that one is close to a hard sell because it's expensive. But. So we commonly call them eels. T uh, technically an eel is a jawed fish and the, the only native eel that we have I believe is on the east coast. But they're a long skinny fish. Um, we just, as a common name, they're called, we, folks call them eels. Um, it's kind of unfortunate because it's, it's the same label as the fish in the Great Lakes. And folks, a lot of folks recognize that that's a problem there. And so a fish that already needs a better PR department gets a little worse. Uh, the tribe's call, uh, tribe, tribal name is Skokwell for them. But So the question is, the, what's the major uh, food source for, a, if it's adult lamprey, it's typically salmonids, but they will feed on some uh, marine mammals. But it's, it's, it's mostly um, salmonids. And that's why they, they kind of follow, you know, salmonid populations tank, so do lamprey populations. I, well, for me, they're a prey buffer. So it, most folks will like one or the other. And if you can say, well, they're a buffer for the species you do care about, right. that has won some points with some fishers and other folks. Willamette Falls is the only legal place to harvest lamprey for anybody. Um, and it's open to everybody. Um, any tribal member can show their tribal ID, they have to get a harvest card and they can harvest fish. That season is typically 1st of June to the end of July. And it's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday and daylight hours. Um, what we do is, uh, as a department, we have a lot of elders that can't get out there. Um, it's a, it, a lot of the year, it's a pretty dangerous place to be. So, we will go out and harvest lamprey. Um, I, I, I see someone here whose daughter actually helped process lamprey uh, for us years ago. And so they get processed, packaged, and then they're distributed to the membership um, for ceremonial purposes. Did I, did I cover that? They eat them. They eat them, they eat them yes. <laughs> so the question is, how do you get them off the rocks? So. Uh, they, they do a couple things. If they, um, most of the time, the, it's very simple. As soon as you grab them, they, their first instinct is, I gotta get out of here, and they kind of release. But they're wiggling around, and, and they're really, they're fish, they have no scales, so they're really slick. So you need gloves to hang on to them. Um, the other, some, on rare occasions, they'll hunker down, they'll think, uh, I know you're trying to get me off this rock, and they can, they've got another gear and they can hang on <laughs> tighter. You can still pull them off. It doesn't take any great effort, but you can tell they're really hunkering down. And then the other thing that happens is they're all congregated in those pools. So um, you have to, if you're trying to get more than a few of them, um, you have to be really careful because as soon as you, uh, if you do it wrong, they all know something's up. And it's weird. You can get a fish over here, but this fish over here, if you, it, it's, it creates a vibration in the water or something, but you can be, and I have been, just covered with lamprey because they all release then, and then they all are jumping out of the water and trying to get out. So, uh, but the main thing is just that they're, they're really easy to pull off the rock. You just need some way to keep a uh, grip of them. Okay, so the question is if, if uh, uh, trying to get them, I've mentioned ladders and modifications you can do to get them through the ladder, but. How do you get them back out and do some of the same systems work? Um, and that obviously is a really challenging thing even for smolts. Um, what's really tiresome to hear is that it can't be done. There has been some evidence about getting smolts back out um, and different, different designs to do that. Um, I'm hoping that what we'll see is that the same things that work for smolts will draw the lamprey in, but I, but but there's still a lot of arguments about what works for to get some uh, smolts back out, and lamprey are way down that list of figuring out what works. <laughs> I, I lived. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>